Oh, uh, God, do you want to? Yes, well, in the words of Richard Epstein, picky, picky, picky to begin with. But, uh, but beyond that, um, I, think you, I think you have to understand where we start in this project, which is uh, with a claim that is very insistently made and has been for a long time. In other words, if we started with textualism, I think that's great. But we don't. We start in this debate with a claim that really the text means something else. I mean, that's not being invented by Senator Pierce. It's not being invented by Earler. It's basically coming out of um, the Fairman uh, uh, Berger narrative. Um, because I think textually, they're clearly different uh, and ought to be analyzed on their own. That's the first point I would make. Secondly, uh, I do thank you for getting me started on the uh, debate research, because I think there's a lot to be said. I think some of these quotes need to be put in you know, various kinds of, uh, of context. I mean, for example, if Howard is saying we want to put the question of citizenship uh, under the Civil Rights Bill, that can't be a discussion of what comes out of the committee, because the committee didn't draft any citizenship language. Um, so more contextualization um, will be needed. But the third point I would make, and I, I will stick with this, is there isn't any way to do textualism that's distinct from narrative. It's simply not possible. Um, the reason we analyze our Constitution in the way we do is that it's our Constitution, and because um, everybody in this room has bought onto some version of a story in which people come together and create against whatever backdrops or uh, whatever you want, a system of government by which they lived. Who were these people? What were they after? And so forth. Then we interpret the text. The narrative that is told both within the legal academy and generally in this country about what happened in 1865-66, as Jamal noticed, in his paper, is, is impoverished. It's, and, and a lot of it is just flatly wrong. Um, the idea that, which, you know, I think people in this room may not operate under this misapprehension, but there's plenty of people in black robes in this country who do, you know, that, that uh, the blundering generation caused a tragic, needless civil war, and then these hateful, uh, the hateful clubfoot uh, Thaddeus Stevens desiring to crush the virtuous South came up with this crazy uh, idea of, of equality and so forth, that narrative is shaping very powerfully. And I would, I would offer you Flores uh, versus City of Bernie as, as Exhibit A, uh, shaping very powerfully the way that the text of the 14th Amendment is, is adopted. I don't think we can get out of the trap, whatever, whatever you think, and I, I'm perfectly eager to have 14th Amendment doves along with me in this, I don't think we can get out of the trap of interpreting section one by saying, oh, we're only going to do the text. I think we have to get out of it, or we have to make progress by enriching the narrative. Um, and I have encountered, this, this paper comes out of encountering the consequences of a very specific narrative that's been told, and I think I, I want to make it broader. Uh, thank you, uh, Garrett and Chris. My first um, troika for quite a while was Thomas Colby, um, but it now expands to uh, Thomas Colby, Kurt Lash, uh, and David Upham. Thomas. Um, okay, I mostly just an observation and then, and then a question. Uh, I guess my thought is, I'm not sure that you need to stake out a form of originalism, narrative originalism, and I'm not sure that you need to, you know, sort of criticize the methodology of what you call Da Vinci Code originalism. My sense is that <coughs> your evidence and the story that you're exploring and, and telling is very relevant to anyone who seeks to use any form of originalism in interpreting the Fourth <coughs> Amendment. If it were the case that the 14th Amendment was intended to simply co codify the Civil Rights Act and put it into the Constitution, and it was intended to do that and nothing more than that, and it was generally understood by everyone that that was what it was intended to do, then obviously for public understanding, for intentionalism, and even for textualism, we would say, well, we want to have a sense of what does this text mean, 
this is useful information that, about what it might mean if everyone was saying, here's what it means, a lot of smart people, the people who wrote the text are saying, here's what it means, it means this and nothing more. That would be helpful evidence to look at it is, it, as a matter of textualism too. And to the extent that a lot of people have fallen into the trap of thinking that this is the narrative that you're pushing back against is the correct one, and you're saying, no, it's not, I think that becomes very helpful to anyone who wants to do any sort of originalist work in this area. And I almost think you run the risk of, if you stake out a new camp, say, I'm, I'm, I, I reject all of you, I'm this, then you, you, you lose some of the, what you are saying should be of value to everyone in this room. And, and, and you need not pick fights. Um, and then the question is, I, you know, I just got a hint of it in, in the paper, have you thought through yet what the implications are of your research for the story that we often tell about segregation under the proper meaning of the 14th Amendment, or affirmative action, or the other kinds of questions that people have often analyzed, or incorporation, which you, I mean, you talk about it, but so much of the popular analysis has been, well, the 14th Amendment was intended to constitutionalize the Civil Rights Act, here's what people said about the Civil Rights Act, and it, it, the more that you're undermining that, do you have any sense yet of what that's going to do to the correct answer to questions of affirmative action, or incorporation, or segregation? Kurt. I, I love the paper, and Garrett, I, I appreciate you reminding us, those of us who are working in, the, in this area, that there's a very complicated relationship between uh, the Civil Rights Act of, of 1866 and the 14th, the 14th Amendment. Um, and the way I understood, and, and also the, the political moments that occurred during the drafting, of, of course, I think you're, you're absolutely right, and it can change and should be viewed as potentially changing what they were about and what they were, what they were trying to do. My, my question involves, though, what exactly, what was the political environment, just to, you know, just to buy into the narrative here for a second, what was the political environment after they break Johnson's veto, okay? Because um, other scholars, William Nelson, Earl Maltz, and others have talked about the continued role of the moderates, of the moderate Republicans, um, all the way through that summer, until the elections of that, uh, elections of that fall, as, as, as putting a break, okay, um, on what would likely be successful texts, um, whether statutory texts or constitutional texts, um, out, of the, um, out of the 39th Congress. Now, as I read your paper, it, it almost seemed like the, the Republicans were a, you know, a body of water waiting to break forth, right, once the, um, the veto is broken. Now they could finally accomplish, accomplish their goals. My, my understanding, though, is that there were still hurdles. Um, and that there were still going to be a variety of positions, even among the Republicans, um, regarding how far they wanted to go and how much they, they wanted to accomplish. So really, this is, this is just a question um, of your sense of, um, of what that role was, and do you agree that they continue to, uh, to pose a brick? I just wanted to, to echo the, the statement, the, the, the importance of two originalisms, 14th Amendment originalism, of doing things beyond the text. Uh, because to the extent to which that, that um, Southern redemptionist narrative uh, has either direct or indirect sort of effects on people's approach to the amendment, um, it undermines the whole, the whole enterprise of studying the 14th Amendment because if you're, you conclude that, it's, that the people who, who made this amendment were bad people, they were either intellectually uh, deficient or morally deficient, then what they did isn't worthy of study. Um, it's not wor and it's not worthy of recovery or preservation. It be it's, uh, whether it's an ink blot or not, it would be better if it were an ink blot, and leave it as such. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, uh, I, the idea that I shouldn't call it uh, narrative originalism and then declare war on all everyone else in the room, I think, makes really perfect sense. Um, what I'm trying to say something is let's stir a little more narrative into all our originalisms, that, that it's a much more modest proposal uh, because I don't have a complete school of thought um, ready. I have some, I have in my head and in my uh, uh, book, Democracy Reborn, some of the answers you asked for. Uh, the affirmative action one is right on the tip of my tongue. I'll let you know as soon as I publish it, it'll, it'll be great. But right now I just can't, I disremember it. But uh, some of the others, I, I think I see the 14th Amendment as being 
overwhelmingly concerned with politics and with maintaining a democratic political system. And to my mind, textually, that's the difference between it and the Civil Rights Act. Um, but that's a discussion for a time when we have more time. Kurt, you're, you're absolutely right. There, there were still, I don't regard there ever having been any group of Republicans who were the radicals and who said on day X, hot zooty, we can do everything we want now, right? I think the, the incentives and disincentives changed after Johnson was suddenly, uh, you know, think last summer about the difference between Obama before the debt crisis and after. People really did look at him differently. And I think that the idea of how far we can go, the restraint became not the president. The restraint became what can we sell in the elections in the fall of 1866. And that was definitely, you know, so, uh, you know, Chris is, is, is spot on to quote someone like Henry Raymond, who was a spokesman for that part of the party that, that said, you guys are going to, you're, you're leading us onto the rocks, don't take us too far. So, yeah, I think that, that, that that's very important. Um, and, and David, you know, I'll just say real quickly, one, part of my project of writing about the 14th Amendment was to try to salvage those people. Because I think of them, I, I had, I spent four years writing about them. I had a very emotional relationship with them. I think of them as people as worthy of study and respect as our framers. And I wish more people did. Um, and my book is my feeble attempt to, to move it that way. So I think your point is very well taken. Um, just briefly on the segregation point, so the, 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 the single strongest piece of evidence that uh, Alexander Bickle cites in his, in his famous piece is actually uh, this March 1st uh, uh, thing from James Wilson's, obviously not, not the James Wilson we, we've been talking about, but uh, he says in March 1st, 1866, and this is actually in an, discussing an earlier draft of the Civil Rights Act that uses the term civil rights and immunity, so I think it's actually better evidence of the text, of, of, of what was expressed in the text of the 14th Amendment than the actual Civil Rights Act. And he says this doesn't require uh, separate schools. My uh, 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 sense reference piece, I actually go through a bunch of this stuff, and it, it, I explain that you know, this is important evidence, but you have to look at his rationale. His rationale is schooling is not a privilege given to all citizens. Uh, 1874, you find a, a, a Republican saying schooling is a right given to all citizens. That's why we're allowed to desegregate the schools. Uh, and I think it depends on that factual determination and we're allowed to disagree with the framers uh, about that. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 think, I think you're absolutely right that segregation was what we, what in the terms of this conference we'd call expected application. I, I don't think there's much question about that. Whether, whether it is actually original public meaning is, is more complicated. Yeah, it's, it's important evidence of yeah, it, yeah, but exactly. it's, not, it's not dispositive. Exactly. Uh, the uh, next troika, I'll take the, um, I'll abuse the privilege of putting myself on it, and then Larry Alexander and uh, Mike Ramsey. Um, my question to Garrett, I think, is, is maybe more a kind of question about rhetoric than anything else, but it seemed to me you kind of associate um, the uh, advocates of the idea that the 14th Amendment is coterminous with the Civil Rights Act, with the kind of Ku Klux Klan history of the 14th Amendment, the sort of gone with the wind view of Thaddeus Stevens. Um, and um, I, given that the, the Civil Rights Act itself was quite radical in many ways, um, and the Gone with the Wind people probably wouldn't have voted very enthusiastically for it. Uh, I guess my question is whether it is fair rhetorically to associate um, people who read the 14th Amendment um, as, the, as coterminous, uh, whether it's fair to sort of associate them with, with the Knight Riders, and even with, wh whether it's effective rhetorically for you to do that, given the questions that's likely to raise. Um, so that was me, uh, Larry. Because um, two years ago, I think it was, I heard you give a very convincing paper uh, about the meaning of the citizenship clause, and, and uh, I, you know, I've, I've gotten instruction from my, you know, the the cognoscenti, such as my colleague Mike Ramsey, about, you know, what is what, what the meaning of of, of not subject to 
you know, the, the, uh, the jurisdiction of any foreign power. Um, and um, or what means subject to the jurisdiction of the United States, right. to put in the 14th Amendment. My question is, I, and, and, and given the way you started your paper, I was, sort of, I was sort of expecting to see this, and then I didn't see it. What is your explanation for the change from the negative in the uh, Civil Rights Act, so the not subject to any foreign power, to the affirmative in the in Section One of the Fourteenth Amendment, subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. My question. Um, well, I actually did want to make a, a point that's uh, somewhat related to the citizenship clause too, since that's the only part of the Fourteenth Amendment I know anything about. Um, but uh, it, it's a. It's a it's a broader point, which in, in some sense I think I want to celebrate Chris's endorsement of textualism, of course, um, but also to maybe express uh, even further skepticism about uh, a lot of this um, legislative history, uh, as it were, uh, and um, in taking off perhaps from the citizenship clause and the uh, and the quotes that uh, that Chris has given us. Um, the, the problem I have with a lot of these, um, a lot of the reliance on these, um, on the, the uh, congressional debates is that I think that people often speak uh, imprecisely or uh, in, um, uh, in, in uh, terms that are not uh, um, absolutely, uh, you know, sort of lawyerly. They're, these, are, these are debates, people are getting excited about things and they're, they're, they're speaking in general terms. So. Um, so we have a long list of, um, of quotes here. I mean, this, this is just, I think, maybe illustrative, but I have it in front of me, and since I'm not real familiar with the debates, this makes for a good example. Um, we, we have a lot of quotes here that say, um, well, this, this, this is pretty much the Civil Rights Act. We're just doing it over again. Um, and, uh, but the question is, that, that's sort of a general statement, but it's not a particularized statement. It's an imprecise statement. And so just take the citizenship clause, for example. So um, as uh, Larry was saying, so the, the citizenship clause in, in the, uh, the 1866 bill has one kind of phrasing, and then it, the, the citizenship clause in the 14th Amendment has a different kind of phrasing. Um, and then the move I take it is, you say, is, is to say, well, we have all these people who said that the Civil Rights Act was the same as the 14th Amendment, so pay no attention to the text. Um, but uh, look at these, uh, look at what they said. Now, I, I have some real doubts about that move, as I'm sure you do as well, uh, because, uh, among other things, when they're making statements about, oh, the Civil Rights Act is the same as the, the, the 14th Amendment, they're probably not thinking specifically about the Civil Rights, uh, the, sorry, about the uh, Citizenship Clause. They're, they're thinking sort of generally speaking they're kind of the same. Um, so, and, and I, my guess is that you would agree with me up to that point. Um, but the, the point that I want to push a little harder on is that do, do, does that not um, undermine to some significant extent the, the utility of a lot of these debates in, in terms of um, getting at sort of the, um, the precise meaning? And we can, con we can construct these, the, these narratives which give us some general idea of what's going on. It's important to have you know, the right narrative and push back against some of these not-so-good narratives. Um, but at the end of the day, how much can we really get out of um, the, these general and imprecise statements um, in, the, uh, in the, uh, the, quote, legislative history um, to answer sort of specific questions um, about, the, uh, about the scope of the text? And is, are, there, are there better places to look um, for answers about um, what it means? First, as to what you just asked, yes, absolutely. I think, I think a lot of this stuff is really not very useful in producing specific determinative answers. It's, and, and I think to some extent that's true of the debates in, in Philadelphia as well. I mean, you have people saying, here's what I think, and, and you can kind of get a kind of general picture of it, but it doesn't mean, I don't think either of us would say, oh, we can, we can look at what Raymond says, and at this moment that means that that's what the bill meant. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm starting out involved with people who want to take the position that the legislative history, if that's the term you want to use, trumps the text. And not only 
Does the legislative history of the text trump the text? The legislative history of some other text trumps the text. And then finally, I got into a thing where somebody said, well, clearly, uh, you don't understand the debates that led to the uh, Expatriation Act of 1870. And, uh, you know, at that point, you know, I mean, sort of reason has left the building. We're just, we're just putting people's speeches in place of the very hard, almost impossible work of construing the text. And I don't think that any account I can give of the debates will, from that, somehow uh, answer the questions. Um, the, the question about where does this not subject uh, changing into subject to the jurisdiction thereof, what, what is the genesis of that? It's a little murky. Because, in fact, the, the Joint Committee didn't have citizenship language in its proposal when it came, and it was passed through the House with no citizenship proposal. Um, when it got to the Senate, it was introduced by Senator Howard, who basically stood up and said, this is a great, Section 1 incorporates the first eight amendments to the Constitution and applies them to the states. You know, are you listening over there in the press gallery? And some, you know, that, that tends not to be quoted a lot of times. But then... Ben Wade stands up and says, well, dude, you haven't done anything about citizenship, and I've written some language here on the back of this envelope, and, and the debate kind of breaks down because people are like, what is Wade doing? I have no idea. Um, and, and Howard pulls the bill off the floor, and there's a three- or four-day period of secret caucus, Republicans' caucus. And at the end, they come back out with the current language, and they say, well, this is the language we all agreed on, and of course it's perfectly clear, and, and no one has any real clear idea of what went into it or anything else. So it's an interesting subject. Maimon, uh, you know, I certainly uh, think it is always appropriate for to question my rhetoric in particular. Uh, I get a little carried away. I'm not sure that Ku Klux Klan actually appears in the article. No, but club-footed uh, Thaddeus Stevens, sort of that image of... Dunning. Uh, you say Dunning. Well, you know, I will spare... No bastinado for Dunning. I think the man did uh, terrible harm to our country and continues to. But uh, I don't think of Dunning as being a Klansman either, myself. Um, uh, and, uh, and I do think that the picture of uh, having taught a seminar to law students in the framing of the 14th Amendment, the picture of Thaddeus Stevens lives on in people much younger than we are. They just come into the thing and say, oh, yeah, I saw about him in the movies. He was terrible. Um, but... I will certainly look at the uh, rhetoric again. In terms of the textual difference, I mean, the Civil Rights Act says mm. not subject to a foreign right. power, right. and then the 14th Amendment says subject to the jurisdiction of the U.S. Mm. It seems to me that the, you know, the difference is what if somebody's subject to both, right. and the 14th Amendment is saying those people are going to be citizens. Mm -hmm. Senator Connus from California uh, uh, at, in, in the... Uh, 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 debate on the 14th Amendment seems to give that explanation. It's mm -hmm. like, if, you know, these, these Chinese aliens come in, you know, they have kids. Yeah, there aren't that many women who come, so they're not going to have that many kids. Wong Kim Ark quotes mm -hmm. Connus, and I, I think that's basically uh, uh, right. In terms of, uh, yeah, I mean, you've got to take all this with a grain of salt. Uh, because you're taking it with so many grains of salt, uh, it's better to have uh, hundreds of pages of uh, Congressional Globe stuff instead of just a few uh, which means, I think, going to 1871, uh, Civil Rights Act of 1871 mm -hmm. and uh, Civil Rights Act of 1875. Uh, many of you have probably seen the 93,000-word uh, behemoth that I've uh, uh, had on SSRN for a while that uh, does what I think we ought to do. Uh, my next troika so far is um, Mike Rappaport and Mark Tushnet. I'm not sure what a two-person troika would be in Russian. With dva, I guess, is two. What, Vika, what's a, yeah. Hmm. Uh, but, but Ilya has now joined the, the troika. So we're... You know, that was very helpful. Um, and we'll... Um, so that's... And um, so let's start there, and then I'll take further names. Um, Mike Rappaport. Originally, I, I was going to ask the question that Larry asked, so I, I'll come up with my second question. Um, and I think this might have been referred to before, or earlier on in the day, but let me, let me come back to it, because I think it's very interesting to think about the changes between the Civil Rights Act and the political situation and um, the legislative history there, and then the understanding of the 14th Amendment. What's sort of interesting is we've got the kind of mirror image, or if you will, 
about the 13th Amendment and, and the Civil Rights Act, right? So, so um, one of the things that, that Jennifer says, she was going to bracket and say that the, the legislative history to the, to the Civil Rights Act would be taken as legislative history, you know, for our purposes. She wasn't endorsing it, but she said, well, just assume that. People tend to assume that. Will, will, will be taken to be the legislative history for the 13th Amendment. And it's, it's kind of interesting thing to think about because you have the opposite problem. You know, was, I'm not saying this is true, uh, but it, it's kind of interesting. So one take on what happens with the 13th Amendment um, is, you know, they, they fought the Civil War. We're gonna, <laughs> you're going to end slavery. We're done. <laughs> um, and all of a sudden, you know, you've got black codes. You've got all kinds of, you know, three-fifths problems or the ends of three-fifths problems. You've got all kinds of problems, and it's like, Oh my God, we screwed up. So, well, of course, the Civil <laughs> Rights Act covers um, it, 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 the 13th Amendment protects the Civil Rights Act that justifies the Civil Rights Act, right? Uh, you know, we, we would be idiots if, if it didn't, right? So, a different context, um, and, and it's the reverse problem because you've got an expand, arguably, arguably, an expansion of the 13th Amendment. Uh, from that. So it, it's just kind of interesting. I would wonder what you thought about that character and, and Chris as well. Mark. I can't, I'm not sure I can formulate this, the introduction to this right, but here's where it is now in my head. Do you think, and this is maybe for the room as a whole, that the following is a coherent form of originalist argument? Okay, <clears throat> so on, I'm taking the chronology from page 14, but I'm making up the facts. <clears throat> on March 12th, there's a delegation of senators who go to Johnson. And Johnson says to them, I might sign this if you agree with me that words X, Y, and Z mean thus and so. And the Republicans go, the senators go back and they say on the floor, <clears throat> the president said he'd sign it if we agree that X, Y, and Z means thus and so. And we agree that X, Y, and Z means thus and so. Okay? So they pass the bill with everybody saying X, Y, and Z means thus and so. Then Johnson uh, vetoes the bill. And then on three days later, four days later, the Republicans gain the power to override the veto. Um, and again, hypothetically, they say, now we don't have to worry about what Johnson thinks X, Y, and Z means. We think X, Y, and Z means something quite different. The same words, okay? Uh, and now we're enacting it over his veto. Is it coherent to say that the meaning of the words as enacted, as embodied in the Civil Rights Act under this hypothetical set of situations has changed from March 12th to March whatever, 28th, when it's adopted. It's the very same words, okay? So it may be that I'm not as familiar with the literature in this area as you are. In fact, I certainly am less familiar, but I'm having a little bit of trouble sort of figuring out sort of what the target you're shooting at in this paper is in that uh, it seems a lot of it is sort of focused on challenging the Fairman and Berger view, which you say on page 11 lives on in contemporary scholarship. But my impression of contemporary scholarship is actually an overwhelming consensus that Berger and Fairman are wrong. This is what Michael Ken Curtis argued, Akhil Amar, a whole range of scholarship. Uh, you do try to quote well, Earl Maltz as sort of being, in some sense, in a Fairman tradition. But what Maltz says in that quote uh, is just that it's clear that the 1866 Civil Rights Act is included in Section 1, and it's just less clear what other rights are included. And I think it's hard to quarrel with that, that, you know, Section 1 is sort of the baseline, and it's, and it's clear, but there's other stuff which probably is included. It's just we have to do more spade work to figure out what the other stuff is, and that, you know, I think that it's, it's hard to quarrel with that, and it's certainly that's not returning to the Fairman and Berger position. Now, uh, so I think there's a pretty overwhelming consensus both among originalists and among non-originalists that sort of Fairman and Berger are wrong and the Dunning School is wrong and so forth. Uh, now, I take your point that sort of this lives on to some degree in popular culture and among some politicians and others. I think I 
it may, in my view, live on a little bit less extensively than you said, but it certainly is there. Every time people watch Gone with the Wind, this idea is out there. But that seemed to me a problem more of historical and political ignorance than a problem of sort of intellectual scholarly discourse. So, you know, I, I, I've written some blog posts sort of you know, crusading some of against sort of the favorable view of the South and secession, and not the South in general, but the South and the conduct in the Civil War era. But I think that's a, sort of a different kind of a problem. But that said, you know, there is maybe Edward Earl, I, I must confess I have not read his stuff, but it, from what you said, it doesn't seem like he's written sort of a detailed scholarly study which uh, tries to reinstate the Fairman idea that maybe he's sort of a target that you can shoot at. But I guess I'd like to understand a little bit better sort of what's the you know, what's the target here within the realm of scholarly discourse as opposed to within the realm of, you know, there's historical ignorance out there that the Senator Pierce's of the world can sort of exploit for their own benefit. I, I think I can answer that pretty quickly, um, but, but not in great detail. Um, and that is uh, two things. One is, I think that um, this Berger Fairman paradigm lives on in judicial opinions that I see all the time. And Bernie is a classic example of that. And, and everything that Chief Justice Rehnquist ever wrote about the, the 14th Amendment partook of this. Um, and in that sense, I think it needs to be combated at several levels. Now, obviously, they're not scholars. And I didn't, I, when I say it lives on, I didn't say it lives on to the exclusion of any questioning until I come along. Obviously, people have, have questioned it. Um, it, it, is, it is, I think, rather more reluctant to die than its truth value really would justify. And the other thing is that I get papers that people send me all the time um, that say, well, the uh, content of the 14th, Section 1 of the 14th Amendment and the content of the, content of the Civil Rights Bill of 1866 are precisely the same, as everyone knows. And there isn't even a footnote. And these are people, I think, who are working in, in perfectly good faith and who just have absorbed the idea that we don't need to push on this at all. And that is the scholarly part of what I'm saying. So if, it was, if it's an overstatement, I'll certainly look at it again. But I don't think it's a statement with zero, uh, zero content. Um, Mark, is that a coherent form of, of originalism? Probably not. Uh, but I don't think that's what happened in this case. I think we have different wording written by different people at a diff at, after a time when the president has you know, revealed himself to be less powerful than they thought. So I think there is some reason to interpret different words differently. There might not be reason to interpret the same word, uh, the same words, the same. Um, and the Third question I've completely forgotten. About the 14th Amendment. Oh, should we read the... Well, you know, I think, I think what Chris said about look at the Civil Rights of 1865 to understand the 14th Amendment, I think that's all true. I think that's absolutely correct. But the point is, put it in context that things have changed. So by the time we're debating the Civil Rights Act of 1866, when they passed the 13th Amendment through Congress... Lincoln is still alive. The war is still going on. They have every reason to expect there will be further changes and further development of the policy. By the time uh, the Civil Rights Act comes along, Johnson is president. The war is over. We are, as you note, they are afraid that they are within months or weeks of being overwhelmed by Southern members of Congress, recognized by Johnson, who will arrive in greater numbers than they had, you know, during the. Uh, during the before the Civil War, because of the, the end of the Three Fifths Clause, and so there, there's, you know, you could spend time calculating what are the incentives that they have to talk about the scope of the Thirteenth Amendment now that they might have had not then. Maybe, maybe then they want to say, oh, this amendment changes almost nothing, right? It's just uh, just a few million slaves freed, but forget about it, move along. And then by the time Johnson is president, and everything they want to say, oh, it changes everything. It gives us all the power. It doesn't mean that the statements are useless. It simply means they need more contextualizing. Does, does that make sense? Um, I mean, all this politics stuff. I mean, yes. you know, you shouldn't have false beliefs. You know, you shouldn't think Jacob Howard was was was, was a kook. But I mean, you know, here's here's an example. Of what I think those debates uh, tell us. You look at Section Two and you look at Section Five. Very very similar. I think you can learn a lot about what Section Five means from how 
uh, 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 they were interpreting Section 2 of the 13th Amendment. I think mm -hmm. it gives you a, a, a you know, reasonably strong argument for, for Morgan against Bernie, maybe. Um, um, in terms of, so, I mean, I, you know, I think the fact that, you know, uh, Jen's intuition that uh, 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 subsequent uh, uh, interpretation of the 13th Amendment is really, really valuable. I think that, gives, you know, if that's true, it's, I think it's also true of the 14th Amendment. And, mm -hmm. I mean, the proposition that I want to rely on uh, the 1872 evidence for is just a really basic proposition, which is the Privileges or Immunities Clause is a, uh, an anti-discrimination provision. Okay. I mean, just that, it's an equal citizenship uh, clause, and I, you know, I piled mountains of, uh, of quotes, uh, you know, it's kind of side of a barn door uh, uh, kind of things. I think it's, you know, you have a discount rate over time, but uh, I think it's pretty conclusive as I read it. Oh, in terms, of, in terms of Mark's thing, I would think, you know, if they, they stipulate to something and then recant, I mean, well, to heck with them. They're, you know, they're just, they're not trustworthy. Um, yeah, you know, read the text or... I think the, the, the text that. means what it means, mostly, and then, you know, the... If the they say it, A yeah. and then they say not A, well, right. that's, you know, that's not reliable. I have um, Stanley and uh, Steve on the original list. Is there anyone else who hasn't um, jumped in in the session and would like to? Um, and then uh, Larry and David. Um, Stanley. Answer Mark's question in a different way than Garrett did, and say, "Yeah, that's a perfectly coherent narrative. It, it, what happens uh, is the words uh, of uh, oh yeah. To to respond to your question directly, it does mean that the meaning of the words has changed, and why? Because they are now differently intended by different speakers, so they have changed." <coughs> No problem whatsoever. And then I want to put a question to Garrett, which I think relates somewhat to your response to Mike Ramsey's questions and your response. And it's, I want to specifically focus on the last paragraph of your uh, essay, um, in which you say, uh, the motivations and situations of individual actors are significant the timing of events and proposals is significant as well. All too often, these elements are slighted in legal discourse. Well, I want to suggest an emendation to the sentence, which might, in fact, constitute a challenge to it. And this is more speculative when I, when I uh, put these points forward rather than I'm firmly asserting uh, what I'm about to suggest. If you substitute for our slighted in legal discourse, the uh, preposition by, our slighted by legal discourse, uh, you would then be, I think, moving in the direction of familiar debates about legal autonomy. And in those debates, one position, called often the formalist position, uh, put forward, let's say, by someone like Ernest Weinrib um, in his 1988 Yale Law Review article on formalism. And Weinrib's point, and it's again not, he was not the first person uh, to make this kind of point. Roscoe Pound and others made it uh, long ago, um, is, uh, is that the kinds of topics that are fruitfully, or questions, or pieces of information that are fruitfully introduced into legal discourse are limited to those questions that legal discourse is supposed to first ask and then answer. So Weinrib, in his essay, uses phrases like foreign concerns, foreign and alien concerns, because he's trying, as those of you who know the essay, he's trying to beat back any version of the law and argument that exists on the face of the earth. He wants it to be law and law, uh, and that's it. And that, so that therefore, 
Uh, and I'm, this may be an entire misreading of your enterprise, and if it is, I'm sure you'll, uh, uh, you, you, you'll, you'll tell me. Uh, but it might be that what you're complaining about, to some extent, is that legal discourse is insisting on being legal discourse and not some other thing which would, if it were some other thing, look further to a fuller story. So is it the business of legal discourse to be looking for a fuller story or to be looking for the legal story? Steve. Um, I think I wanted to agree with and add uh, something to Stanley's first point here in response to Mark and in disagreement with, uh, I think, Chris and, uh, and Garrett, though I think Garrett's uh, was perhaps ill-considered his response and, and his own interest. He uh, should have given the other response. Uh, but um, not only could the meaning of the same words, or let's say the same marks, uh, right. be different um, on an intentionalist account, but it, I would think that on a more um, conventionalist yes. or public yes. meaning account, they could be different as well. But that wouldn't seem at all odd to anybody. I think if you said, well, the, these same words spoken in, you know, 1850 mean something different than the same words spoken, you know, 100 years later. The only reason why Mark's point seemed, you know, it seems so counterintuitive is because he only had a few days, I think, uh, right. in between. Days. But uh, if the change is you know, were rapid, as I think Garrett's trying to say, you know, there was a, a pretty rapid and radical shift in the climate, I, you know, assuming that's right, then there wouldn't be anything at all, I think, odd about saying that, uh, that the meaning of those words or marks changed. And I would think that you would want to agree with that because that gives a little more bite to your, you know, to, to your overall argument, you know, it makes it more significant, you know, to, to describe this sort of change. All right. Well, yeah, this is, this is, this is piling on there. This is uh, uh, also I was, when Mark made his ask his question. Uh, I when Mark asked his question, I, I that's when I got on the queue as well, and uh, so I have the sort of Humpty Dumpty view words and and yeah, uh, you can intend by any you know words or codes. You can intend by any code, any particular meaning. Now, the problem with you know. We meant this on, on Monday, but now we, 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 because we were constrained politically, but now we want to mean something different on Tuesday by the same code. The problem is that you risk not getting the right uptake in your audience when you do that. But there's nothing conceptually problematic about it. It's just that it's strategically not a good idea. I mean, if you're going to change, you're going to change the meaning and you're now free from the political constraint, you might as well change the code in which you express it, because otherwise you're, you're risking getting really misunderstood. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Um. Professor Fish, I am unable to address you by any other title. I was in his seminar. A near-death experience for me. But um, the question is, uh, should we look for a, a fuller story or a legal story? And the answer is always and already both um, in the following sense. Uh, we are here uh, studying originalism as variously defined. That, by definition, moves our inquiry beyond sort of employing formal legal techniques of inter interpretation. I mean, we could look at the Citizenship, citizenship clause or whatever and say, you know, Blackstone says this and, you know, the expressio unio, et cetera, and use entirely um, autonomous legal uh, concepts to interpret that. I think most people have found that in the constitutional context that's, that's not satisfactory. Originalism is one of a number of impulses to reach to a wider... Uh, a wider set of interpretive materials. Okay, that's step one. Step two is originalism almost by definition involves history and historicizing to some extent what's going on. Step three is that doesn't mean turning law into history. Okay, uh, because I think as, as uh, the point was made um, in one of the papers, and in the terror of addressing Professor Fish, I've forgotten which author it was, but uh, who said, 
uh, you quoted Jack Rakoff saying, you know, it's just not a question we would ask, we historians. You know, the questions you lawyers are interested in. And we do need to produce some kind of move the ball toward the answers. So it has to remain, to, to that extent, autonomous. But I think to the, that if we're trying to historicize events, we really should try to do it in a sophisticated way. And my problem with people saying, oh, Section 1 is really just the Civil Rights Act is, you know, not that it's legal, but that it's bad law, it's bad history, it's just unsophisticated. That, I think, is, is the answer to that. Um, the other two questions have drifted completely out of my mind because it's late I in the remember. afternoon. Okay, uh, go. But, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so I, the initial hypo was a mm. small group of key senators makes right. a stipulation, then recants it. If everyone in the Senate says we think it means A, and mm -hmm. then everyone in the Senate perfectly explicitly, perfectly mm. clearly, in a way that could get uptake, says, no, 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 now we mean B. Okay, yeah, that would be a change in the word, but... Uh, if it's just these people, you know, having these little colloquies in the in the legislative history as if they're negotiating a contract or something mm -hmm. like, that's not uh, uh, reliable. I look at that and I would I would, I would dismiss it, uh, and uh, you know, unless it were you know enough. But yeah, theoretically, sure, you could have a real quick change. But, the but it, it you know, it, it I'm I'm interpreting it as a sort of converse to the signing statement uh, move that's been added to legislation. Um, uh, and particularly, uh, you, you know, where, where the president will say, uh, though I had no part in enacting this statute, I now interpret it not to limit my authority to torture anyone I want. Um, and I think you do, there does come a point where sort of stating that the meaning of something is X really doesn't, doesn't move the needle. And I mean, or to make sure you even yeah. think that you're, you know, well, you're saying you, you, you construe it not to mean yeah. uh, uh, limiting your authority to, to, to torture. Probably does. Yeah, like, exactly. You know, so, uh, you so wouldn't say so if it didn't. You know, I was interpreting interpreting your fact pattern as being, you know, people saying one thing deceitfully and then two days later saying something else. And my answer would be, and this in a funny way links into Stanley, is well, gosh, that all sounds like really useless information. Why don't we start with the text and then see where we go? Because part of the question would be, what did you say? Um, that's probably uh, not a satisfactory answer, but it's best I can do at this, this late in the day. I think um, we have, in fact, reached, uh, if not the witching hour, at least the dinner hour. Uh, I've been reflecting on whether the role of moderator is more do little or more think. Uh, maybe <laughs> just about half and half. Um, yes, um, honest Jake. Uh, with great thanks to everyone uh, for having come to a terrific con conference, and thanks to Garrett and to Chris. Yeah. You've got me... Uh...